is that you have a galaxy and an active nucleus, and it throws out one of these low-mass plasmas, which is the quasar, in the beginning of the quasar. And there's some sort of magnetic field in the center of this galaxy or in the center of the nucleus. It's probably tangled. You don't care what the form of that is because when it's stretched out, the, the magnetic field lines are stretched out this way. Now, this, this quasar obviously breaks out of this uh, magnetic cocoon or whatever it is. And at that stage, I would think that it's a plasma, uh, but not a net charge. In other words, you've just vaporized the material, or you, you're going in the opposite, opposite direction, uh, so that the pluses and minus equal, uh, so there's no net charge. However, they're swinging around and emitting all this X-ray and Bremsstrahlung and so forth. As time goes on and they cool, the electrons go into orbit around the protons, that's not a smiling face. That's supposed to be a, <laughs> a, a, a primeval hydrogen atom. And, and it's beginning to form uh, atoms and molecules and stars. And this is the progression into a com companion, into a new galaxy. And here, I want to emphasize this guy. I think this is of interest to this group. There is something known about the magnetic fields in galaxies. And for instance, the Japanese astronomer Sofue and some others have done polarization work in the spiral arms, and they find that the, that, the, that the magnetic field lines run out this way and then back this way, uh, in one direction on the outside and the other direction on the inside. And what I think is happening is here is that these same ejections that are coming out as quasars in the, along the minor axis come out in the, in the disk of the galaxy, and they drag the material out with it, and they form these sort of flux tubes in which there's some material, ionized material of the galaxy, which then are, is constrained, or maybe even there's pinch activity, and they form these characteristic young stars around, along the galaxy uh, spiral arms. And so what I'm trying to say is I think there's a unified um, phenomenon here of ejection from these, from these nuclei forming quasars, new galaxies out this way, and pulling out material of the old galaxy, forming these new stars and so forth, and that uh, I would suggest this as a sort of a mechanism for understanding galaxies, evolution of galaxies, birth of galaxies, and, and so forth. So there it is. I thank you. I'll show you an example of this. Uh, this is NGC 1232, a famous SC1 spiral galaxy in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, I had worked on that. There's this little galaxy that has a redshift one-tenth the velocity of light. And it's, it's, uh, I would argue it's, it's obviously interacting with this arm and uh, causing a disturbance in this arm right here. This galaxy is a, it's obviously a, a companion galaxy. And, uh, and you can see it comes out of this this arm here. The point is that these, this is probably an ejection in the, in the disk of the galaxy. And I will argue later that the, actually the spiral arms are formed by these ejections. And this is a nice tie-in with the plasma theories that we've been talking about here. Since they're moving in the arms, they're slowed down a little. They develop earlier. And this is a companion galaxy just making the transition. Uh, here, this is plus 5,000 kilometers per second higher redshift. And everybody said this was obviously a companion. And then they found out what the redshift was. And they said, no, it must be an accidental configuration, even though you could trace it back here and see where it came out of the arm and that's sort of the slot in here. Now, th this is a particularly beautiful photograph. I think it was voted the most beautiful photograph of 19-something or other. It's from the VLT, the new uh, European uh, Space uh, Organization, ESO, uh, um, eight meter on power now. And this picture is pasted on the uh, bulletin boards and the walls of all the major observatories in the world. And everybody looks at this and they don't notice this galaxy and they don't notice this galaxy. I talked to one of the, my friends who was responsible for posting this around. I said, you know the story on this. And he said, yes, yes, I know, I know, but we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> This is a, uh, one of the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, known as ARP-105. And uh, here you see a beautiful example of ejection. Here's this uh, 
uh, ejection coming down this way. Uh, it's called Ambartsumion's knot, and it's obviously uh, uh, a uh, galaxy in the making. Here's a quasar redshift 2.2 over here. The ejection has obviously gone off in the other direction also and punctured this galaxy and formed this big uh, uh, plasma loop out in here. So this is sort of an example of a physical example of what happens when you can see these ejecta where they intersect other material and what, what they're like. There's a whole lot of uh, companion galaxies in this area, and the next slide shows that they're uh, systematically redshifted. And you see this is at 8,500 kilometers per second, and they go up to 8,900 kilometers per second. Every one of these companions is redshifted. And this is another terrible controversy that's been going on for years and years, and, and the professional and the conventional astronomers say, no, that uh, this is just an accident because uh, if, if these are really velocities, of course, you should have as many coming towards you as going away from you. And in fact, they're all positive, which means that there's an intrinsic component in there. And even though I've been saying for years that if you look in our local group and the M81 group, that 22 out of 22 of the companions are all positively redshifted, people will still say, well, it's not a big enough sample or maybe an accident and so on and so on. <laughs> but it's a very important in this story because this is where the, the younger galaxies wind up. Uh, this is a, 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 late, a re more recent, uh, quite recent picture of, of the jet in M87. And this is taken with the VLA uh, in Socorro, New Mexico, the, uh, the uh, radio telescope, the best, the biggest radio, radio telescope we have now. And here's this famous jet coming out of the center of M87, and uh, I'll show you what else is going on in M87. I mean, we could, get, we could spend the whole uh, afternoon talking about the Virgo cluster. Amy showed you some of it. The, main, the, the center of the Virgo cluster is down here. But I just put this in here to, uh, as an excuse to make the following comment. The conventional picture is that these are plasmoids shot out from the... Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, th th that this is an ejection of material coming out and that these are shock fronts. There are shock waves out in here. And they are going with 0.99 the velocity of light. On the Hubble Space Telescope, you can actually see them move from year to year. Uh, and if, under the current theories, you make them move that fast, you have to pump a tremendous amount of energy into them. And if you pump that uh, much energy into a normal plasma, it's just going to dissipate. It's just going to blow apart. But we have to, because there's a string of galaxies along here, and because there's a quasar out here, and because there's another cluster out here, and so forth and so on, we have to uh, get these things to evolve into, uh, condense into quasars, and then in, and evolve into galaxies. And the, the thing that I will talk about is if these are new matter in creation coming out with zero mass or near zero mass uh, they'll be moving initially with the uh, s speed of light, uh, and then as they gain mass by communicating with the rest of the universe, we'll talk about this in a minute, uh, the, in order to conserve <coughs> momentum, they have to slow down, as we've seen from the ejected pairs, they have to slow down. And they gain mass. Uh, that's going to reduce their kinetic energy. It's going to reduce their temperature. And instead of blowing apart, they'll be able to condense into new galaxies. And I think this is a very, very important uh, uh, conclusion to draw from all these observations which I'm, I'm showing you. Uh, go ahead. This is the latest thing, and I think this is extremely exciting. Uh, this has to do with galaxy clusters. I uh, said in seeing red that it looked like the galaxy clusters were associated with nearby galaxies. And this was really the worst heresy that I could have imaginably said because everybody even including my closest friends had said, that's crazy. They can't do that. Uh, it's, you're going to really, ups, you know, you're going to ruin the whole thing. <laughs> 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 but, but nevertheless, with the assistance of, a, of, a, of a, an amateur or high school teacher in northern New York State, we put this paper together. And here are two clusters. They're t indicated here and here. They're very populous galaxy clusters. And they had a redshift of about 17,000 kilometers per second. And, uh, and they both have the same redshift. And they form this pair. 
And so we know where to look when we find a pair. We look in the center, and lo and behold, here's a, uh, an active galaxy uh, with a redshift of 5,000 kilometers per second. So it's the low redshift galaxy, which is a host to these. And what I plotted here is the circles of the 17,000 kilometers per second redshifts and the pluses of the 5,000 kilometers per second redshift. And you can see that they're intermingled. So they can't be at different distances in the, in the universe. They must be at the distance of this nearby uh, cluster in the center. And you can see them actually intermingled along this line. Now, the, the really thing that was exciting, because uh, just two weeks ago, uh, it appeared on the, uh, on the internet preprint server that they'd taken this in Chandra, the new high-powered X-ray telescope. They'd taken it with Chandra and, uh, because it's pouring out a huge amount of X-rays. And they've identified what they call a bow shock here. And they concluded that the thing, this whole thing is moving out with 1,400 kilometers per second along a line which is exactly back to what we said was the origin. So this, I think, is the, is the newest uh, revolutionary step. And that is it's implying that as these quasars come out and they break up, they can break up into a whole cluster of galaxies, something that people have always said were out at the edges of the universe along with the quasars and so forth. The next slide, I think, shows the, the center. Uh, no, it shows another example. Uh, in this paper that's submitted now, and by some miracle, I think it's going to be published, uh, there's another example of, uh, these are atlas objects, 470, 474. A pair of quasars across here. The chance of these bright quasars, they're both 3C quasars, is about 1 in one in 10 to the ninth, one in a billion of being accidental. And then these are Abel clusters. And you can see how their redshifts match again, 0 0.049, 0 0.046, 070, 0 0.067. So this, we've shown about 20 examples of this now. The next slide shows a, 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 a sort of a random, it's not a random picture. This is, these are high redshift quasars, and there are about four of them together. And the favorite explanation for this is that it's gravitational lensing. And they want to have them gravitational lens by this foreground cluster here. But they never seem to notice that this foreground cluster extends right back down the line to this big, bright galaxy here. So this is just sort of a, a random uh, example of, of the connection of, of these high redshift objects to the low redshift objects involving the clusters, which nobody can see, uh, except if you look at it this way. This is the newest one of these uh, clusters of galaxies. It gives you, gives you a good idea what these clusters will look like. They're very faint uh, objects. And these are isophotes of X-rays. Uh, so this appeared also in the ESO messenger. And when you see this, this definite elongation of this cluster this way, immediately we would ask, you know, what's up here? And exactly 14 arc minutes away is this big galaxy, NGC 720, with an X-ray filament coming out and curving down along in this direction. So this seems to be sort of you know, a breakthrough, and, and this is just happening right now.